Now, I do run a bit of a music channel here, but you're probably here because you're looking to make some really cool ways to show what your sound is doing in a video format, or you're some sort of visual artist looking to use sound to create animations with. And I, in my day to day, I actually do 3D with visualization, virtual and augmented reality, and showing how data can be used in these spaces to create that. So I thought, let's blend those two little ideas together and create an asset like this, a simple little volume part, which is a really cool way to show what sound is doing, but go through the full pipeline. You've probably seen down there that it's quite a long video, but I thought instead of just like blocking it off, it's like, let's go through the process of using Blender 3D and Geometry Nodes to create this visualization. Then we'll go through the process of bringing into a scene setting up the animations in Blender, making it a little bit more easier for you, and then go into post-production and creating a nice little scene like this one to show your sound. So other than that, I would say grab a cup of coffee and we'll get straight into it. All right, we're in my studio and I'm in front of the computer, not all these fun bits here but yeah we are in front of blender so i'll leave a link down below if you haven't touched blender before and i want to sort of put this in a way that's really step you through the process because we are using 3.3.0 which is one of their long-term support versions so not much should change in this tutorial for a while uh, but yeah get blender downloaded and we are going to use this cube to create a volume bar so i'm just going to select these two so holding shift select delete and then I'm left here with my cube. And we're gonna actually make this a little bit more programmatic. So one thing I've been really liking about Blender at the moment is its new geometry nodes, which is a node-based system to create geometry. And it's really functional and it creates some really cool things. And it works with these blocks. And how it works is you can break it apart. There goes our cube. We can connect it together and we get our cube back. And we're going to actually generate our own geometry in here. So this is quite interesting how it all works. So first of all, I'm going to call this my volume bar. There we go. And it pops up over here. And you'll notice there's a few more um, variables that are going to pop up here. So like ways we can control our object. So first things first, I am going to create a line. So I can go Shift A and that'll bring up this menu here. Or we can go Add and that'll bring up the menu there. So there's a few different ways we can access the menus, but Shift A is a really quick way to do. I'm going to search and I'm going to create line. Oops, if I can spell line, mesh line, this one here. And then if I connect it there, we get a line. And this is really interesting because it's not just like a point A to point B. It has points in between. And with geometry nodes, it uses those points quite a lot to calculate where things should be going. So Next thing, because I don't want just a stick for our volume bar, I'm going to give it some mass. I'm going to create a grid and I'm just going to plop him down here and then connect that one up and we have a little square and then we can control the size of the square how we want. We can increase the vertices. So um, there is geometry happening. So if I do that, it should bring it up. Yep. So and I'm just going to set them to two because all we really need is a quad, which is just a square and then once we got those two together, I want to generate one of these grids on every point. So see how it's got 10 as the count. Uh, we're going to create a plane on each one. So how do we do that? Shift A again, and I'm going to go instance on points. Drop this one in here. And we don't want to get the points off the uh, grid because that's going to create like four dots on a square. We're going to use that line. And then we're going to use this mesh and put it as the instance. So what's that saying to the software is I'm going to use this plane. And every time I see a point, I'm going to duplicate that plane. So we can actually change it. And all this, it's going to copy the same information across, which really useful for us. Because now we've sort of got like that volume bar and we can control the height, control the size. And we'll work on that a bit later. Uh, but right now I want to give it some thickness. Just going to go back into the mesh because right now it's paper thin and we want to add some volume to our volume bar. So I'm just going to go search extrude, extrude mesh. So this is a little bit of a class that allows us to get a plane and give it geometry. So I'll just go. Shh. So we go all that together and scale it down and we could scale this down and oh, we got that sort of shape that we were looking for. And 
this is a really good point to be at, but we could go in here and start tweaking like the sizes and that, but we want to start programmatically making this work. So, and first things first, I want to get that volume control. So when I bake an audio curve, I can attach it to this uh, sound as a single variable. So we're going to have a look at this group input node because we can attach little variables to see what's going on. Uh, first things first, I'm going to click this little arrow. It's a bit tight, actually. I'll hide my face for a sec, this little arrow here, click him and go down to group and then we can start editing our group. So that's where that cube was, what we we're working on. I don't actually need that, so I'm just going to start a new one, which is an input, which is a float, which is what I want because this is for the audio source. So I'm going to put in, oops, uh, and I just want to touch base. When I'm writing, I usually write in camel case, which is a programmatic way of writing names where it's like the first word, it's all lowercase, but every word afterward has the first capital. Uh, it's just a nice way to read what's going on. And as you saw, as soon as I hit enter, we've got that audio input sitting right there. And I just want to clamp this variable so it can't go outside of zero and one because our audio is always going to be between those two variables. So zero and one so now no matter how much i try and push that variable it's not going to come out of its side so we'll just keep that as zero and we got our audio input here next like if we only want 10 segments it's perfectly fine we could attach the count to the audio input and do it that way however i want to have a little bit more control over this i want to know if i can have 16 segments or four segments so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to create a second one, but this one is going to be an integer. And the difference between a float and integer, they both hold numbers. A float holds between zero and one, so I can actually have 0.5. So really good if for like the data that's in between. So volume, you can have half volume, 25% volume. An integer is a number that's like one, two, three, four. You don't get that in between. And this is how the uh, count works. So we're going to use that as a way. And I am going to call this uh, segments because that's what uh, the volume bar little dots are called. So segments and keep that lowercase. Cool. And then we're going to do a bit of math. And for a bit of math, shift A, we go search, type in math. Here we go. We got a math node. And I'm going to create a little multiplication that does a sneaky trick where I can times the segments by the audio input. So if something's at half, half volume, it'll be half the segment. So if I go multiply, I go segments multiplied by the audio input, goes into count. And we lost our value, but now I can say 16. We'll just type it in, 16. And then with our audio input, we can go 0.5. We've got seven, seven segments eight segments so yes uh, but yeah we can actually control our little volume thing and it goes all the way up the top to the bottom uh, but we might want to scale this around so instead of coming back into the geometry nodes like we can definitely sort out this we can play around but what I might do is put all the variables up here um, so first off I want to create a new float uh, and we're going to call this offset because I'm going to use this in a second and then what I'm going to do, this is really a neat trick, is we can just drag and connect up here. And then we'll bring it across. So now we've got the size of the X and the size of the Y, but now our size of the Z is here. And it's a bit funny because we have that um, stepped where it's like, it's like over however many segments, so 16 segments, it's just going times that. And it's like, no, I want to sort of say the height is two units high and then the segments fill up in between. So we're going to do another tricky math thing and what we're going to first do is we're going to shift a and create a combined xyz so this is dealing a little bit with vector math and with vector you have like the three axes x y and z and we just want to control the z one here because uh x and y looks a bit weird uh you could have like slanted uh segment displays that would actually be kind of cool uh, but what we could do is we just want to control that Z value. So I'm just going to connect that up and then I can break away that Z value here. And then if I go shift D, 
I can duplicate and we are going to use the segments with the offset that we want. So we're going to use the segment amount and then we're going to divide that by the height. So I'm going to turn this into a divide and then I'm going to create a segments and bring that down here. And then sometimes I get this wrong, but now we've got a new variable here. I'm going to call this uh, size Z because this is the up axis. And then I'm going to connect it into Z here. And if I raise this up, oh, got it the wrong way around. So I can just grab this node, bring it down, it'll flip it around. That looks about close. And then if I hit one, cool, we've got a nice little cube. And then I can make that two, and it's like two times the height. But we haven't really controlled the offset over here. And I could drag this variable over and connect it up here. Uh, but let's say we want to control the offset between each as a zero one as well. So I can take this variable here and we're going to create a new math node and I'm just going to bring these out across here and I want to connect him up in here and then I'm going to do that same multiply trick to create like a percentage of a certain amount because I know this is the max amount of the offset between each one and then I want to divide it by the offset here which has made it a flat plane but if I scroll this little variable up here until it reaches one cool so we have that offset between the variables and we can control it that way and because it's only a zero to one variable this zero term make this one cool and then if we control him we shouldn't be able to break away nice so we have our audio input so we have the volume bar that we can control and then we have like the amount of segments we want so we can go brrr, make it really high or really low uh, we can create that offset and we got the size as well, so we can change the X, Y, and Z axis. So really good point to be in, but there's no color and like a blank, like green, maybe a red tile up the top. Uh, could be boring, but we are going to create a material. So I'm not really using this uh, window up here. So if you want to change it, and what I recommend changing it to is the shader editor, this one here. So we can actually see what the color is. So this is how we're going to make this uh, pretty. And then we're just gonna have it white because that's what's happening up here is we've just got a base color and it's going straight through and it's not actually connected to our object. And that's because I haven't added something yet. So another shift A and we're gonna go set material. And a material is what this is here. So we have the material output which has a shader and a shader has a whole bunch of variables and same thing as the geometry nodes we have a bunch of nodes that we can use to control the geometry so I'm just going to make sure I've got material and I'm going to go volume bar mat try and keep it clean so we know what is doing where and it's just baseline red and now we can go in here like volume bar red now we have a red volume bar but we want that gradient that goes between zero and one so what we can do is now we're going to start editing the shader and we want to edit that base color so i want to create something called a gradient map which is something like this and then what that does if i just plug that straight into there we should see a black going to white and it's in the wrong direction we're going to fix that up but we can work with this and another way we're going to change the color if I bring in a color ramp and then that is black and white again but then I can say well no I want my blacks to be red and then we can click on this one and we can make our green very Christmassy so we want to change this so it's not this way we want it this way so we're going to do a bit of um, vector math to make it come from the bottom here so that little yellow point that's where our geometry is generated from so we can sneakily use that to control where the geometry is going so I'm just going to shift a and go mapping oh we got this node here it looks a little bit crazy but really it's just all the data for where this can be positioned from and then I want to bring in a new node and 
and I want to add another node called texture coordinate sweet and what we can do here is we have the object so this little yellow dot here I'm going to connect this up to the vector coordinate which is going to tell that that's where we want to start it from so if I plug that into our gradient it's going to take a bit of time to think sweet now we've got that coming from that center point so the gradient sitting there but we want to go and rotate it around so if we grab the Y and then go 90 and make sure it's come from the right direction so we realized our textures and it looks a bit weird because it's each individual one and I forgot to add something that's very special to our geometry nodes because instances, as I said before, uh, they're duplicates of this object here. So this is actually extruding all the duplicates. So what we want to do is realize instances and we just chuck that block in between there. So now we've got the gradient between zero and one and then we can use this one here to stretch it out over our object which we're going to do a bit of work here but now that we've got that scale we have the colors and that's actually quite cool it's done the uh, red to green and I think I've got that the wrong way around so I want to flip the color ramp so we've got red up the top so if we know that we're clipping we're clipping so we're almost there we have almost got our volume bar but there's a tricky little thing that's happened because if we're trying to scale our volume bar so if we go back in here and then we scale it up see how the gradient isn't following along and there's a bit of a tricky way we can do it but first things first I want to transfer this number here into the shader because the mesh or the uh, geometry nodes doesn't really transfer it natively across so we've got to do that ourselves so what I want to do is I want to plug into this number here at the end and we're going to do the mapping so First things first, we've already dealt with some mapping here by creating this XYZ and we sort of want that number to come up here. So I'm going to shift D, we duplicate that and we're going to bring it right over here because we're going to take that and plug it in here. So we're outputting our vector and then I want to get this height and then bring it across over to here and we got that number and it's a vector uh, we're going to create this as a mapping uh, and we probably want to give it a bit more of a descriptive name so see how it's trying to point it well if I get rid of my head see how it's trying to point towards something but we're going to create our own custom way to point it. so I'm going to go VB for volume bar underscore uh, mapping scale so that's where I'm pointing it to this mapping node to the scale in the volume bar and how I connect this point to here is I am going to go shift A I'm going to search for attribute and do that and we've got that vector and we plug that in here and how we connect the two is I'm going to grab this scale copy and paste it here and sweet we've got the data transfer but it changed its number but there's something happening here which is really weird if we want our scale to go up here see how the variable is shrinking so and this is because it's a bit of an inverse if I want this to be one and then I go we'll just detach it for now and make this one a gradient is fine but if I want to go two for the scale here we need this number to be 0 0.0.5 0 .5 and it brings up here so we've got one number that needs to go down and another number comes up and we create an inverse so there's a sweet little math trick here so I'm just going to grab this math node it's called divide um, math nodes do quite a lot so just read the title but I'm going to multiply the height actually no I'm going to divide that by one and that's going to inverse that number there and then I'm going to connect that up here see how it sits at the top now if I scale this it should be nice and follow sweet and that's our volume bar so we have all the nice fancy variables that we want to connect here uh, we can control the volume bar itself it's all snapping nicely so this is a really nice little asset 
that we can work together on. And now we've got this, I'm going to actually name it volume bar one. And we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping inside of Blender because Blender has a really nice feature with, it's called an asset browser. And this is when I started really getting into Blender because I usually have working files and then I'll have authoring files. So the working files is a file like this, gray blob of the thing that I'm working on. And then I can bring that into another scene where I'm actually doing the actual animation. So that means I can take this to other projects and use it for a lot of nice other things. So first things first is I'm going to see how it turns into like a little crosshair up here. I can click and we'll drag that out you can scroll on this bar and then I'm going to pick this one and I'm going to select asset browser and it's completely blank but I've just got volume bar one if you want to go ahead and make some more like I did uh, but I'm going to right click markers asset boom we have that sitting there in our asset browser but we haven't saved this file so we need to save this in a library file and I do have one set up so I'm just going to save as uh, Blender Asset Library is my library file, and then I'm just going to type in uh, volume bar. So I have some V O L U M E because I can spell uh, bar. Save it in there, and I want to create a part of the library. So I've got all my library files sitting here for a bunch of stuff that I do. Uh, just for tutorial sakes, I'm going to create a new catalog new catalog here we go and you can call this whatever uh, you've got your file structures of handling things and if this is your first time to blender like I usually keep all my um, effects sort of stuff in here so you can see I've got other volume bars I've been working on so we'll just call this volume bar and then I'm going to go there uh, unassign I can just click and drag that one there so if I select that, I've got a volume bar sitting inside my catalog and then I can save that and it does have all the texture and stuff. It just doesn't show it when it's up here and we could create some other stuff, but we are in a point and how we can connect Blender. I should have said this in the first place. Um, we go edit preferences, uh, file paths and down here asset libraries and we create a file that points to a specific directory on your computer and that's how we direct blender so what I can do now because I've saved this file I'll just save it again control s and now I'm going to go file new general um, hit a which is selects all delete and then I can do that same trick again to bring out a new window scroll along asset browser and go to use library volume bar there's our volume bar drag it in boom we got a volume bar and if we go into modifiers we can see it moving texture it so we got the textures so this is how I quickly bring out a whole bunch of them and then I can start working from there all right we're in a really good position now because we've got an asset but we can change it up if we want to we can change the scale we can change the size we can change the segments and that's why I got you to put it into the asset browser because like we're going to go into the next stage where we're creating a bit of a scene with it but you can change it up however you want and create some really cool ways to do it and you're getting all that investment out of one asset that you put together so me being me, I actually went and created a few other different types of geometry nodes and I created a whole bunch of these different volume bars and if you want to support what I do, definitely click the link and check it out. And also, if you found any of this video useful so far, definitely give it that thumbs up because it tells the algorithm to point this video to other people. People that might be looking to add volume bars to their music. So yeah, if you can, thank you so much. And yeah, because it's such a technical process of doing this uh, feel free to leave a comment down below if you have any questions or anything you want me to explain a bit further I'll definitely be down there helping out so let's get into the next section where we create and stage and animate this thing really nice point now if you did download the pack and you jump straight to this section we're going to start adding these packs so uh, go back into desktop uh, I've got the asset browser loaded up if you're just jumping in and you want to know make sure you save it to a library file that you have um, 
connected Blender to that library file and then you've got the volume bars here. Uh, you'll find it probably under effects and volume bar if you've downloaded the pack. We've just been working on this one here so I can drag them out and this is a new scene so all I can do is just drag and drop a new one in. So I'm just going to set up something because I do a lot of work with the poly end tracker. Uh, I'm just going to uh, this one center and I'm just going to drag out a whole bunch of these to work with so shift D and we'll use the snap tool and we'll have four G uh, X so we can move it along the X axis uh, it will snap to there if you don't like using the hotkeys you can click the ones here to do the movement so you can do that and then hold control to snap as well so now we have four volume bars centered and we'll just create a really quick backdrop so I'm just going to hit shift A uh, mesh plane scale it up by hitting S or you can use a scale here I'm going to hit tab and we'll hit 2 so we go into our line here just like that and then we can hit E or we can extrude as well so we can extrude like that I'm just going to go um, E, so I extrude and hit Z, so I extrude it up. And then I can select this line here, and then I'm going to apply a bevel. So bevel is this one, and I can bring it out. And if you want to tweak some of the settings too, you'll see this little box pop up down here. Open it up, and we can add some segments, make it look really nice. And it's got a nice curved background, uh, probably a bit too for a camera so I'm just going to select it up and then I can select scale and I'm just going to bring it right out so I've got a wide scene so I can see what's going on and I'll probably give it a bit of a flat backdrop as well uh, you might notice that it might be a bit see how it's got lines across here it might be a bit hard with that mode yeah see how it's got the lines we can go object shade smooth now we've got a nice curved backdrop and we'll do a bit of tweaking backdrop and you can choose whatever color you want um, probably something to complement these so we could do a white uh, or it could be edgy and do like a black background and I might fiddle with the roughness as well so we've got metallic specular roughness uh, do that and all this works with uh, how to edit the volume bars as well you can go in and change the colors if you want but we've got something here they don't have emissive, so I'm going to add a light to my scene. And usually I have all the assets in a scene, so all the moving things. And then I have another collection. So if you click this button up here, we'll make a new collection. This is where I keep all my, like if I'm setting up a photography stage, this is where all the cameras and lights live. So I'm just going to shift A and we're going to add a camera. It's going to be in a weird spot, but we'll just plonk this one here. There we go. All right, we've got a camera. It's a bit hard to move and try and make it look at. So we're going to do a sneaky trick. Do that. Uh, I'm going to add an empty. So empties are really nice to control things with. They don't get rendered and they're just an object. Just going to make it a bit bigger by selecting its uh, object properties. So every object has a bunch of different properties like cameras got camera stuff. Uh, but what we want to do to this camera is make it look at this empty. So I can go up to constraints and I'm going to add a constraint called track two. And then I'll do that. Then I can use this little eyedropper tool to pick out that empty and boom, we have it looking at that. And it's just a lot easier to make the camera look at that and work along it. Uh, we don't really need this at the moment so what I might do is I'm going to change it to another 3D viewport but I'm going to hit zero and that's going to show me what the camera sees. So I can grab this, uh, we'll go slide on, do probably move that empty up because what's in the camera view is going to get seen. Uh, we could move this sort of like that so just a bit of staging. You had the volume bars in the center, uh, something nice. We can see what the color is going to see, but we are working with non-emissive stuff, so it's pitch black. 
and we probably don't want it pitch black so we're just going to add a light into here too so keeping our spelling nice and neat so we go camera target shift a and we're going to add a light and i usually like working with area lights when i do stuff like this they're quite nice and soft so drag that one up and because i'm working on the lighting and there's a few different ways we render lighting but we're just going to stick with the ev pipeline which is a real-time render engine real time meaning it's not a hundred percent real time but we've got a sense of we can actually see what we're building so I'm just going to scale the area up. You can also click and drag to scale the area up, but see how the light sort of turns off because it's applied at the lot. So we go back down to object properties and we're going to drag this number up till we got some nice light happening. And you can see where the shadow's going and then it blasts itself out. So we've got something, uh, we've got this set up here. And what I like to do is I'm just going to hit F12 just to get a sense of what I'm going to see with the volume bars. And we've got some shading, we've got the volume bars sitting there, uh, staged quite well. There's a little bit of noise, we can bump up the um, shadow count. So really happy with this one. Now we're at the really cool point where we can start animating our sound. And this is using a trick where um, we use the volume of the sound to create our animation curve so we can bake it into Blender. So if you've got like a two channel sound or a mono sound, like you'll just get one audio bar, but like say if you're working in your door and you have a whole bunch of different tracks, you can save out each one of those tracks as an audio curve. So I do a lot of work with the Polyend Tracker, which I get all these different audio um, lines out. So it's got eight tracks, it's a tracker. So if you don't know how they work, each lane has different sounds that it can play. Uh, and it's like, I know track one is usually my drum track. So. so we've got drums and then each one has a different thing. So I'm going to use this project here to show how to animate. And we've got the audio bars, got everything set up and I'm just going to select the animation tab. And there is a nice thing that we can do and see how it's that split top again. Uh, I like to set this one to animation, graph editor this one here, select that and we'll just hide this one for a sec and we'll probably bring this in because we don't really need to see what's here, we're just animating bays and what we want to do is we're going to select one, go down to the, we'll go down to the modifier properties and then we want to start animating. So where you see these dots, you can animate a whole bunch of these, like you can make it do that if you want. but we set this one up so we can animate this bar here. So I'm going to hit I on the keyboard and that will create an animation track for it. And just make sure that this is lined up with zero. I have just jumped straight into this frame so I knew it was on zero anyway. Uh, you want to know how long your song is but we'll see that with the animation data. And what we're going to do is animate that. You can also animate by right click and go um, right click one and then we can insert keyframe and that will create an animation track. So we've got this selected, we've got an animation for it. We can go up here, select this key and then we can go bake sound to F curve. Now, as you can see, this is a bit of a fun time through menu. So I'm gonna right click this. And I'm gonna to add to quick favorites and then I'm gonna click it. So it's going to tell me where do you want the sound to come from, which I've got this lovely little point here. And if you're on a Mac, you'll have your way to go into Finder, select the URL and bring it in. So I'm just going to copy that. Whoops. And I'm just going to paste that there, hit enter and whoop, we'll do it with the top bar. Sometimes it does work like that. And I'm going to select track one, which is that drum track. And if you ever dealt with compressors, uh, this is a really nice way to look at how this thing's working. So it's taking a full brain frequency so you can like do your low pass, you can do a high pass, so you can select like a really controlled frequency band if you know there's certain things happening. Uh, your attack and decay time, so like on a compressor how much it cuts in, how much it goes out, so we'll get like a really jagged line if we make the attack really high or we could have long uh, releases, so it's quite interesting. Uh, the threshold so if there's no sound like a noise floor we can cancel that out and we can do a few other tricks but i just like it on these ones these normal settings for now and then i'll tweak them after so 
we'll go bake sounds at F curve and we'll start seeing some of our animation data. So I can drag it out and we can see how long our song is. So when I usually work on trackers, I keep all the working files at this end. So typically that's the extent of my song there. Uh, but if I bring it to a section and play, if I, sorry, we will have to extend it out. So I'm just going to select a point here, uh, say 2,250 like that. And I will add a little section if we're working to a specific frame rate. So like you want your animation to be at like 60 frames per second or that. I usually just leave it on the default unless I'm doing something specific with video. So it's usually 24 frames a second, but we can change that if we come out to output properties and you'll find it there. So usually I work at 30 frames per second or 24 frames per second. But when you do this baking sounds to F curve, it will use that to calculate where to put the animation curve. So you want to make sure it lines up, but I'm just going to keep it on 24 frames per second. 225, got 225. So if I just let the animation run from this little section here, we can see our little animation bar working. And if we like, want to see it in color, we can. Uh, we could see it in this one, but it's a little bit janky. It's not designed to render at real time, uh, but we can get a sense of what's going on. So now I'm going to add the sounds to the other track. So I select that, and then I'm going to take that back to zero. And because I did that little trick where we can bake, um, get that quick menu, if I hit Q and I'm just going to go here, hit I, got that animation curve, got that set to zero, and then I'm going to hit Q up here, bake sounds to F curve, brings up that menu, and I can go select two. And this is the quickest way I found to do this in the vanilla version of Blender. There are other tools and add-ons you can use, but if you're only dealing with eight tracks, it's quite easy to sit there and add them all. Uh, but if you've got a whole bunch of audio tracks that you're trying to work on, then it's probably a little bit better if you want to look at another software, like a plugin of sort. But for what we're doing here, this has just got everything the way we want. So last one, hit I, Q, bake sounds at F curve, and then track four. Sweet. So we've got all the animation data. You can see some of these are flatlining at one or a little bit higher, but because we've clamped the sound, it's not going to pass along. And if we just hit play, we have all our animations all lined up here, all nice and neat. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We've got the camera set up to render it. So if we just do a, another check, we'll pick a section that has this one kick in. That's if I did have any animation information on this one. Oh, there's a little bit. It's a little bit of a murmur. So we could do a sneaky trick where we can boost it. So if we go up into modifiers, we can add a modifier. We can add an envelope. And I'm just going to take this to the start. And then I'm going to add a control point. And then what this does is we can stretch out a form. So let's say I want this to be too high. See how it's jumped right up to two. But if we make this neg two, brings it back down, but the volume's a little bit louder. And we can see we've got some color boosting up. So we could do that again. Four, neg four, boom. And we've got a little bit of a murmur there. We'll pick a point where we see all four bars something like that. F12. Cool. All right. So we got all our animation ready to go and we're at a point now where can, we can start rendering it out. And this is a little bit of it like its own area, but I've got my visuals and usually I compose my audio in the video software. So this will be a silent animation. Uh, but there's a few things that we could look at to like make our animation look a little bit better. So back in here, and we want to come up to the little camera icon up here. So render properties. And like I said, we've got Eevee, Cycles. Uh, Cycles is the one that takes a lot longer to render. But this is using uh, ray tracing, which if you have like a really nice graphics card, uh, you can use ray tracing. Like it's almost done on mine. I only got a 1080, so a little bit old at the moment. But I can still get away with doing certain things. But it gives you a lot nicer lighting in your test. But... 
with Eevee, it renders a lot faster and we get 90% of the work done. So I usually stick with Eevee. Uh, we can make the shadows a little bit better because they are a bit gran granularized from like how many samples. So changing the render number up is how many instances it tries and lights the setup. So it will take a bit longer. Uh, we could add some bloom. So if we do a render now, you'll see like the edges might light up if the lighting's hard enough. Uh, probably not. Uh, ambient inclusion will add like a little bit of shadow to the inside. So where um, it creates its light bouncing, so it makes things separate out. Uh, screen space reflections. I don't think I have any reflective materials, but you'll get like a bit of a um, bounce sort of very like bouncing of light. Uh, we can add some motion blur. So if we find a frame like this one here, where it's bouncing up quite a lot, we might see it render a bit of motion blur. But this adds a lot of uh, render grunt on there. So tiny bit of blur, not too much, um, but it does add up. On the time up here so you want to sort of manage that but they're the main ones I play with uh, basic scene and what I want to do is I want to start outputting this scene so as we did go in here before I'm just going to turn off my face as I did come in here before we started meddling with the frames per second uh, I'm just going to keep it like that we have the full frame of animation here it's going to be in full HD which is nice. Uh, we've got stereo and then we usually come down to here. This is where we do most of the work for our renders and we can render out an image sequence or like what I usually do is I like to render out a video itself. And when I do the encoding, I usually like rendering out an MP4 just for my personal preference. I find that is the one that most software packages really like to work with at the moment. Um, there's some other more bespoke things I do where I have different ways of rendering out. Sometimes I will render out a full image sequence, which is a different thing itself, but that's usually how I leave my render, uh, usually leave the settings. Uh, and what I want to do is I'll create a file. So if I go to my projects, this is how I name and save all the projects I'm working on. So right now we're doing the audio bars. So I create that and then I will create a new file. So click this button up here. Uh, name it something appropriate so you know what you're uh, rendering out. Uh, we'll call this uh, main sequence because there's no other ones that are popping up. It's just the volume bars and we accept. And then all I need to do now, uh, we'll do just another test render. 77 seconds over 2000 frames, uh, probably a couple of minutes to render. So I'm going to go up to the render tab up here, click and render animation. As you'll see, it'll go through the frames and it's going through pretty fast. So it's already at seven, eight. Yep. So I'll leave it there for a sec and let the animation finish and then we'll come back. Now I'm really happy with that and I hope you followed along with the process and had your coffee with you because it was quite long but being able to create our 3D asset, go through create this staging, do the animations, do all the prep work to get a really nice result at the end, that is what it's all about and really now that you have that asset you can make a whole bunch of different videos using it, uh, different scenarios, different ways but when you have those per track samples or even if it's just a left and right audio field there's a few ways you can break it out and create some really interesting visualizations to go along with your sounds. So in the end I hope you found this one really useful. I do enjoy bringing 3D into a bunch of different areas of what I do. So if you do use this asset, definitely tag me in it as well, because I would like to see what you do with it, as well as how you can continue on. Like you might only use Blender once and you might be it's not for me, or you actually continue on and that's all part of the process of trying different things and doing new things as well. So in the end, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did find anything useful, definitely give it that thumbs up because it helps the algorithm point this to other people. And I do plan to create some more 3D content. I think there's a nice little series here to create some different things like cover art and looping animations and that. So you might see a few more 3D videos coming from me using Blender because we can all get access to it and it's really easy to create things with. So 
In the end, if you have any ideas or you want to see something done in 3D, leave that in the comments down below. I might add it to my list of cool ideas. But in the end, I hope you enjoyed this one and I look forward to seeing you next time.